right, good morning. Today is the last lecture of the mini block that we had about signaling in the nervous tissue. And what I want to do today, together with you, is to show the implications of what we have done so far. So show you how we can use in treatment, usually, um, some chemical substances to interfere with some of the signaling mechanisms, some of the signaling principles that we talked about so far. Okay, so today I'm gonna go through some of the principal structures that we mentioned and that we discussed and show what kind of, uh, what kind of drugs, what kind of medications, what kind of substances um, are actually used in clinical practice, or at least in research setting, but mostly in clinical practice, um, to influence these, okay? So hopefully this should connect and show the relevance of what we talked about so far. Okay, so to start with, uh, we're gonna talk about one of the most important, let's say, molecules or molecular assemblies for transferring information in the central nervous system. And there could be plenty, so of course you don't know which one, which one I'm thinking about, but it's the one that's absolutely necessary for the uh, initiation and sustaining of the action potential. What would that be? Which structure would that be? Acetylcholine. Not really, acetylcholine is one of the many possibilities that can, one of the many possible neurotransmitters that can start an action potential by its, hmm? No, it's a structure that is needed to initiate and sustain an action potential. Hmm? What? Sorry, I didn't hear that. Nothing? Okay. Maybe it was right. <laughs> Indeed, the voltage dependent sodium channels, right? Without the voltage dependent sodium channels, there is no action potential. Okay, and it can be started by acetylcholine or dopamine depending on the receptors, there are many, many possibilities. But without voltage dependent sodium channels, there is no action potential. There is no signal transfer in the, uh, in the nervous system, whether peripheral or central. So, we already talked, when we, when we spoke about voltage dependent sodium channels, we already mentioned one substance that blocks them, blocks them very well and can lead very quickly to the death of the, hmm? sorry, tetrotoxin, very good. So tetrotoxin is not used clinically, it's too toxic to be, to be useful. Uh, but we do have substances that do block these voltage dependent sodium channels and they are used actually quite widely and probably the majority of you or all of you have come across them or have them applied to you. Uh, and these are local anesthetics. Local anesthetic substances that are used, for example, when they, uh, when they are extracting your tooth or doing some minor procedure like uh, suturing a wound or something, then local anesthetics are used to basically block any signals, any nervous signals coming from the specific area. And the mechanism of, through which these local anesthetics work is by blocking voltage dependent sodium channels on all the nerve fibers that are coming or that are close to the area. Okay, so that's, that's the general mechanism through which all the local anesthetics work. Yeah? Are we then not able to move the bad part of the body anymore? Uh, well, can anybody answer? Can you not move that part of the body anymore? <coughs> hmm? yes. What are your experiences? Okay, so the, the answer is it depends. It depends how big an area is anesthetized, how much of the anesthetic was put in because various different kinds of nerve fibers have different sensitivities because the penetration of local anesthetic is different to different types of fibers. So it depends. But those of you, if there are any who had like a big tooth a molar extracted, you probably will know that after the anesthesia, actually it's quite difficult to talk moving your tongue and moving everything in is, is actually relatively difficult. So yes, it can influence motor 
you know, abilities in the local area. But it doesn't have to, depending on the, the amount and et cetera, et cetera. Okay? But, but yes, I mean, as regarding the, uh, the, uh, the voltage dependent sodium channels, they are all the same in all the fibers. So if there is a local anesthetic, if, if, if it can get in, then it will influence even most of fibers. Okay? But the, the sensi sensory fibers and the sensitive fibers, especially the ones that carry pain, which usually do not have very thick myelin sheaths or none at all, those are the ones that are the most susceptible to being inhibited. Okay? And all the motor ones, they, take, they would take a much higher dose or longer time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so the first local anesthetic that came into practice was a, uh, a natural substance uh, derived from a South American, Central American uh, tree bush, um, and that was cocaine. So cocaine was the first local anesthetic, and it's still, in some places, like in the Czech Republic, it's still a legal uh, local anesthetic that can be used in very specific uh, situations, because it does have some adv advantageous um, properties compared to some of the newer substances. But of course, cocaine, while being a very good local anesthetic, uh, does have also other kind of effects. And the other kind of effects, you probably, most of you have heard about cocaine, so what are the other effects, apart from being a local anesthetic? Yeah, it's a stimulant, okay, it's a stimulant drug, which is used recreationally or abused, depending on your point of view. Um, and these two types of effects, so the stimulant and you could say euphoric effect, energizing effect, is completely independent of the local anesthetic effect. Okay, so the mechanisms of the two are completely independent. They work by completely different ways. And that's why it was possible already, I think, in the 1920s or 30s or so, to synthesize um, molecules that do have the local anesthetic effect of cocaine, but not the central stimulating effect. Okay, and these are the anesthetics, local anesthetics that are still used today. And of course, there are newer and newer uh, derivatives. But since the first one to be used was cocaine, they all retain uh, kind of a reminiscence to cocaine in their names. So most of them end with cane. Okay, even though chemically and they have nothing to do with, with cocaine, they're still, they st still end with cane. So you may have heard or, or you will hear about it now, but there are substances called novocaine, like a new cocaine, novocaine, lidocaine, procaine, etc. There are many substances, but they all retain this cane as the reminiscence to cocaine. How do they work? Well, the interesting, they basically block the pore of the voltage dependent sodium channel, okay, the voltage gated sodium channel. But interestingly, they block it from the inside. So first they have to enter the axon and then from the inside block it, okay? Which is quite interesting because in order to block the pore, they need to be generally positively charged, okay? So in order to actually lodge themselves in the pore, they need to have a positive charge on the nitrogen usually. But that can create a bit of a problem if you look at it. Why would a, positive char a positively charged molecule be problematic in this setting? Because? Well, you suggested something, so do you want to? Huh? Well, inside is relatively negative, that's true, but why would that create a problem? Well, the amount of local anesthetic is very small and the amount that gets in is, so it will not really disrupt the membrane potential or not for very long anyway. So that's not really the problem. It doesn't really have the tendency to go out? Um, it doesn't really have to have the tendency to go out. I understand what you're saying, but, but it actually kind of lodges into the protein part of it. So that's also not a big problem. Why is there a problem if we have a positively charged, so we need a positive charge, but at the same time it's blocking the channel from the inside? It does, but w what is the problem there? Yeah. Indeed, okay, for a positively charged molecule to cross the membrane and to actually get in, inside the cell is a problem, right? Because for most charged molecules, a plus, 
plasma membrane or any, any other biological membrane is not permeable, right? That's something that we talked about, okay? So here for the designers of local anesthetics, it created and it still creates a problem because they have to balance two contradictory characteristics of the molecule. First, it has to be charged, but second, it has to be lipophilic enough to actually get through the membrane. And there are various tricks, and if you're really interested in local anesthetics or in medicinal chemistry, you can have a look at how they basically circumvented this problem by adding like bulky lipophilic phenyl rings, et cetera, around it to make it sufficiently lipophilic, even though it is charged, okay? Or the other trick is to have a molecule that normally is not charged, but can be charged afterwards, okay? So it can, in its uncharged form, it can get in, and then here it binds a proton and becomes charged, and so there are various tricks, but that's just for those who are interested in how to design uh, local anesthetics. Right. Uh, what is quite interesting about local anesthetics is since their mechanism of effect is so general, they just block voltage dependent sodium channels, they can also be used in other situations where we want to blo block sodium channels, voltage dependent sodium channels. And since these channels are not only necessary for creating and sustaining action potential in nerve cells, they're also important for... For muscles. Well, in axons, that's what we just talked about. But they're also important for the creation and sustaining of action potential in muscle cells, okay? So, so we have the depolarization caused by nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in the, in the uh, neuromuscular junction, but that has to spread around the muscle fiber, especially in, in skeletal muscle or cardiac muscle. Okay, so it has to spread around. And for that, we also need voltage-dependent sodium channels. It's the same mechanism. So some of these local anesthetics are also used to treat to stop cardiac arrhythmias. Okay, so if there, are, if there is a disorder of how the electric signal spreads in the heart, which can call arrhythmia, so a, a disturbed rhythm of the heart, basically, or discoordination of the parts of the heart, we can use, in some very specific indications, these local anesthetics, at least some of them, um, to kind of slow down the spread of the signal and therefore help the person with the arrhythmia. Okay, so that's another you could say, an independent use of local anesthetics, but the mechanism behind it, the logic behind it, is exactly the same, which is basically slow down, we block the, the spread of the, of the signal. Of course, we can't stop it completely because that would stop the heart, okay? So we have to use a dose that is appropriate and that just slows it down and doesn't stop it. All right, so this was about, yes? No, at least I've never heard of that. I don't think so. I don't think so, but we can maybe discuss it later on if you have like a, where they wrote about this, but I, I don't think so. <laughs> All right. Um, so this is local anesthetics and this is how we can influence this fundamental molecule, which is the sodium, the voltage dependent sodium channel. Uh, of course, in addition to local anesthetics, we also have general anesthetics. And these are molecules that put you to sleep. It's not really sleep, but they put you to sleep so that you don't perceive anything. But we'll get to those in a second, okay? Well, later on. Um, all right, so while we're talking about these uh, fundamental molecules that allow us to create action potential and sustain them, then we can have a look at another group of molecules um, which influence only skeletal muscle, but basically do sort of a similar thing. So stop the action potential from being created. And these are called muscle relaxants. Now when we talk about muscle relaxants, we can divide them into two big groups. One is peripheral muscle relaxants, and the other one is central muscle relaxants. And these are fundamentally different in what they do, what kind of effect they have. The peripheral 
muscle relaxants act in the periphery, so not in the brain, but they act in the periphery. And these muscle relaxants cause complete paralysis of the muscles. Sorry? The peripheral ones, okay? So they cause complete paralysis. They block the contraction of all skeletal muscles, while the central ones have a much milder effect and by a very different mechanism. We'll, we'll get to that. Now, you could ask, well, what, what is the purpose? What is the point of completely paralyzing a person, right? Well, originally, surgery. well, y yes, today we use it in surgery, but originally it was actually used, once again, we have to go to South America, yeah, mostly South America, where it was used by the local tribes to kill animals. So they actually found in nature drugs that do this, that completely relax, that completely paralyze the muscles, and they use them to hunt for animals, okay? And since these molecules do not, they do not absorb from the intestines, the meat from the animal that was poisoned by this was perfectly safe to eat, okay? Because you have to inject it in order to be, uh, to be effective. And the first such preparation, you could say, wasn't really a, a, a pure chemical, but this first preparation that was used, from which basically all the muscle, all the peripheral muscle relaxants, at least some part of them, one group of them, are derived, was called curare. Curare. And this curare, which was basically just an extra extract from a plant, um, was used, it was the, the, the local tribes would take their arrows and just dip them into this mixture and then shoot at an animal. And even if the animal was not killed by the arrow, it was enough to be scratched by this. And since these, these molecules in curare are so powerful, that it paralyzed the animal, and the animal just died because of suffocation. Because of course, the diaphragm, so all the, uh, all the muscles that we need for breathing, are also skeletal muscle, uh, so they will be paralyzed. Now how do these molecules in curare, and the main ingredient of curare is called tubocurarin. Tubocurarin. Um, how do they work? Well, they work actually pretty simply. They are antagonists on nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Okay? So they bind, they come to nicotinic acetylcholine receptors and block their activation. Yeah? Yesterday you said that antagonists don't have an effect on the block. So I don't understand why it blocks the. Uh huh. Uh huh. Can somebody explain that? Because it decreases the amount. You have to speak up so that everybody hears. Because it oh, wait, wait, wait. You want to explain that? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, since it binds on the receptor, does it activate it? And because it doesn't activate the receptor, it just stays there and makes it inactive. So it just blocks it, not the, the substance. Okay. So it binds to the receptor. It does nothing. Right, so it sits on the, on the channel, it sits on the, on the receptor, and when acetylcholine comes, so when a signal comes for the muscle to contract, it can't work because there is the antagonist sitting already. Okay? Yeah? All right, so tubocurarine is an antagonist on nicotinic uh, acetylcholine receptors, and therefore it blocks all contraction of skeletal muscle because this is the signal, acetylcholine activating nicotinic acetylcholine receptors is the signal for contraction, right? Okay, nowadays we have uh, some other derivatives of tubocurarine. So tubocurarine is, as far as I know, no longer used in clinical practice. There are some synthetic derivatives, pancuronium, atracuronium, all sorts of them. And their advantage generally is that they, they are much shorter acting. So tubocurarine takes a long time to be excreted from the body and to be metabolized. So now the synthetic ones, they don't act as long, which is good because if you give tubocurarine or any of the other muscle relaxants to a patient, you have to ventilate the patient because they can't breathe, right? And since so far I only talked about South American tribes hunting animals, well, I have to come to why, why we use it today. So mostly these molecules are used in surgery where 
especially in some major surgery like orthopedic surgery, when they are putting an artificial joint or something like that, it's advantageous to completely paralyze the patient because otherwise, when you're cutting muscles and you know sewing bones, etc., even though the patient is completely unconscious, there may still be some reflexes because, of course, it's very painful. I mean, the person doesn't really perceive the pain, but there may be some reflexes that would start pulling on the muscles and you know increase the tone of the muscles. And of course, for the surgeon, that's very uncomfortable because they can't really do what they need to do. So it's advantageous to completely relax the patient. It's actually used even for abdominal surgery, some other surgeries as well. So it's, it's a relatively commonly used thing to completely relax the patient and it's easier to operate on him or her. But of course, you have to ventilate the patient because they can't breathe, all right? So short, shorter acting uh, muscle relaxants are useful because you don't have to ventilate the patient for 10 hours after the surgery. Now, all these derivatives of curare, all these antagonists of nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, are belong to a group of non-depolarizing muscle, muscle relaxants. So these are non-depolarizing. That makes sense because if you use an antagonist of nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, there's no depolarization, right? So they are non-depolarizing. Well, interestingly, we can also use molecules that do exactly the opposite. So they don't block the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, they activate them to give us the same effect, which is paralysis. And we'll have to investigate how that is possible. So in addition to non-depolarizing peripheral muscle relaxants, we also have depolarizing muscle relaxants. And one of them is, for example, succinylcholine. So this is depolarizing. Succinylcholine, it's what it sounds like. Okay, so it's like acetylcholine, but instead of acetyl, there's succinyl there. And its mechanism of action is that it's an agonist a very strong, very powerful agonist on nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And in fact, what makes it so powerful, apart from binding better to the receptors, is that it is not as susceptible to acetylcholine esterase. So once you give it to a patient, it actually stays there for longer than acetylcholine would. Okay? So the signal is much, much, much stronger. And my question is, well, why does it lead to paralysis? Okay, it's one way of putting it, okay, the, the body gives up. But there's actually a molecular mechanism for this body giving up, yeah? No? You want to try? Hyperpolarization, not really. This will actually depolarize, okay, and they're called depolarizing. This will depolarize the membrane, no doubt about that. Yeah? Because the cannot break it up in because it's very strong. Uh-huh. Okay, now we're almost there with the explanation. So correct, the signal stays there for too long. So the membrane remains depolarized, sort of. So it can't repolarize. That's a big part of the explanation. But why would that cause relaxation, paralysis, and not excessive contraction? Because if the membrane is not repolarized again, it won't receive any more signal. Okay, again, we're getting there, okay. Because it needs to repolarize, like for contraction. It does. And why does it need to repolarize for contraction to continue, basically? Once that the voltage gated sodium channel is not open again unless the membrane is repolarized. Very good. Once again, the crucial structure here are the voltage dependent sodium channels. So when we have a muscle fiber, and here is the neuromuscular junction, what happens there is that acetylcholine is released. Here are the nicotinic receptors, and they will depolarize the membrane, okay? That's what they do, okay? Now, this local depolarization would happen, which happens here would just stay here, or it would, you know, just a little, it would spread out a little bit like when we talk about dendrites. But in order to actually cause a contraction of the whole fiber, we need 
voltage-dependent sodium channels to open to amplify the depolarization, and the next one opens, and the next one opens the same way as we have on an, uh, in an action potential on, on an axon. So in a skeletal muscle fiber, it, it works in a very similar way as in an axon. Here is a little bit of depolarization, and then an action potential starts, which is spread by uh, these voltage-dependent sodium channels. Now, just one second. Now, when we talked about the properties of voltage-dependent sodium channels, we said that after about a millisecond after opening, they inactivate. Okay? So in the, presence of, in the presence of succinylcholine, here is a continued depolarization. It just stays there. It doesn't go away because, as you said correctly, acetylcholine esterase cannot work on it. Well, it can, but it's much slower. Okay? So the, the depolarization here is continued. But after a millisecond, this ion channel inactivates. Well, these ones also in a, in a, in a minute. Okay? Now, this one, because it's still close to the depolarized membrane, which continues to be depolarized because of the open nicotinic channels, this one cannot reactivate because the membrane would have to repolarize in order for this channel to reactivate. So this channel, or the ones that are close to the neuromuscular junction, remain inactivated. And while the rest of the membrane repolarizes, comes back to normal polarity, there can be no more signal from the neuromuscular junction because these channels close to it are still inactivated. And this is what causes paralysis in depolarizing muscle relaxants. There was a question there first. Yeah? Yeah, th there are no cramps or spas spasms, but what you actually see is something called fasciculations. Because in order to have a macroscopic movement, the muscle contraction has to be very tightly coordinated. Okay? In order for a full big muscle to actually contract, all the fibers have to contract at the same time, and etc. Which with succinylcholine doesn't happen. It's completely disorganized. So what you actually see is the individual muscle fibers or muscle fascicles t contracting. So you see a little bit of a movement, and then it stops. Okay? So it's not that the, the person is flailing their hands or something like that. It doesn't happen. But you do see a little bit of contraction in the beginning, and then it stops. Yes? So when the signals uh, get stuck and they stay longer, the one thing they couldn't hear well, is it because there's no depolarization or no repolarization? Here, there is no repolarization. And in order for the voltage-dependent sodium channels to be able to open again after they have inactivated, the membrane has to repolarize first. And since it doesn't repolarize here, the signal cannot spread further. It does repolarize here. That's why the contraction stops after a while. Okay? But here around the, the neuromuscular junction, there is like a, a layer of inactivated sodium channels which, does, which do not allow any signals to come, to, um, to come out. Okay. Yep. <coughs> Basically, just because it stays there longer. It binds better to the receptors and stays there longer because acetylcholine esterase cannot remove it. Because they are voltage dependent sodium channels and they inactivate after a millisecond. It's the same channels as in the axon. They inactivate. They, they inactivate no matter what the membrane potential is. They will inactivate after a millisecond after opening. So they are inactivated. And they remain inactivated because there is no repolarization of the membrane, which we need in order for these channels to reprime. Does this make sense? OK. This is part of the reason why we talked about the properties of the voltage-dependent sodium channels, because it can explain why these things work. OK. There is actually a similar thing with the voltage-dependent calcium channels, the dihydropyridine receptors as well. But let's not complicate it too much. OK. This, this is kind of the general idea of how it works. Yeah. Right. Um, so it can be used in similar settings. It, it will produce the same effect, essentially, as the curare, uh, uh, curare derivatives. The advantage of succinylcholine is that it's extremely short acting. It only acts for a few minutes maximum, okay? because it is eventually removed by 
not so much by acetylcholinesterase, but by some other enzymes. So it is a very, very short-acting muscle relaxant, and oftentimes it is, it is used in emergency medicine for endotracheal intubation, when a tube is put in the throat of a person who is not respiring or is in coma or something like that. Now, uh, you can imagine that putting a tube in someone's throat is not a very uh, pleasant thing, and even if the person is unconscious, they will, unless they are in very, very, very deep coma, or virtually dead, basically, they will defend themselves, not consciously, but, but it's difficult to, to stick a tube some, uh, up someone's throat. So what do you use for that? Generally, succinylcholine, which relaxes them very briefly. You put it in, and then you can start ventilating them, and, and the paralysis actually ends very, very quickly. Okay? So again, it's used for paralysis, but it's a very, very short-acting paralysis. Good. Okay. Uh, so these are peripheral muscle relaxants, and we have depolarizing, non-depolarizing. But I mentioned that there are also central muscle relaxants, but they are a completely different group of drugs which do not produce any kind of paralysis. What they do is they decrease muscle tone. Okay? So even if you're sitting there and not doing anything, your muscles are actually continuously receiving signals from the central nervous system to keep them at a certain tone. So your muscles are not completely flaccid, they're not completely relaxed, but they are you know, at a certain tone. Now, this tone in certain conditions, certain diseases, or after injuries can be too high. For example, when people have problems with their back, you know, they can have the... Um, a nerve root can be, can be um, damaged by you know, bad movement or something, which is very painful, and it will increase the muscle tone around the damaged nerve to protect it in a way. But this actually creates further problems because the, um, the pressure which is put on the nerve root cannot be relieved because the muscles are contracted around it and st still keep pushing on the nerve. So there are some situations where we just want to relax the muscles a little bit, decrease the muscle tone. So we're not calling for complete paralysis, okay? That would be a, an overkill, okay? But we just need to, or a kill, depending on the situation. Um, but uh, what we want to do is just decrease the muscle tone. And this can be done by acting centrally, so not peripherally, not you know, knocking all the muscles out of function, but centrally by inhibiting certain pathways in order to decrease the, uh, the signals that come into the muscles and, and increase the tone, okay? So this is what central muscle relaxants do. And the main pathway or the main neurotransmitter on which these central muscle relaxants work are GABA receptors, as you would expect, because if we activate, if we use agonists on GABA, then we inhibit all sorts of neurons, right? Because the GABA receptors are inhibitory, all of them. So we can have GABA-A agonists. And there's actually a very large number of GABA-A agonists. Many of them are allosteric agonists. So they bind to a different place on the receptor from GABA, but do activate the receptor. Okay, so they're allosteric <coughs> agonists, a weird thing, maybe. I don't know. Um, and the, the specific drugs that are used as... as central muscle relaxants are, for example, benzodiazepines. Benzodiazepines. You may have heard about diazepam, Valium, maybe, but there are many nowadays, Alprazolam, what have you. Uh, they are becoming uh, in certain subcultures, in yeah, certain subcultures, they are, they are becoming a very uh, widely used uh, drug of abuse or recreational, these benzodiazepines, because they're not only used to decrease muscle tone, which they do. In a very low dose, they will just relax your muscles a little bit. But as you increase the dose, they will have other effects. All are mediated by activation of GABA receptors, so basically putting an inhibitory effect on the central nervous system. Remember, GABA neurons are all, all over the place, okay? So if we activate GABA receptors, we will gradually decrease the activation of the central nervous system. So depending on the dose, 
These benzodiazepines can relax your muscle tone. They can remove anxiety. Okay, so they are used as anxiolytics to remove anxiety. And this is why a lot of people use them. Um, if you increase the dose further, they can put you to sleep, act to actual sleep. So they, well, they are still used, but not as much as they used to be as hypnotic. So if you suffer from insomnia, you can also use benzodiazepines to help you sleep. Nowadays, there are other drugs that are mostly used for that, but anyway. And if you increase the dose further, they can actually put you into general anesthesia. So there are some benzodiazepines that are used clinically in the introduction to general anesthesia or for shorter procedures because they can actually really put, put you down to sleep where you can't perceive anything. Okay, so this is just showing that by acting on GABA A receptors, we can gradually increase the inhibition of the central nervous system stemming from removal of anxiety and, and lowering muscle tone all the way to very deep sleep or coma, okay? Depending on the dose. Everything that benzodiazepines can do. And there are loads of them. There are at least 30 or 40 different benzodiazepines that exist and that are used clinically, okay? I think in some of the tables you have some examples, but there are many of them, yeah. Is this also They are, all benzodiazepines are allosteric. Okay, so they're all allosteric agonists on GABA receptor. They bind to a different place. They actually bind inside the channel and activate. So they're like long-term? Uh, it depends. There are so many of them that some of them work, you know, for hours and some of them work for minutes. It's, there are just so many of them designed. Some of them are removed from the body very quickly or, or metabolized. Some of them stay very long. So it depends. Because in my country, like, there is a problem with the abuse of this yep. kind of drug. Yep. And like, right now, people say that like, it causes dementia, like, it, it makes you like, much more stupid, and whatever. Is it true? No, no. I mean, there's, no, there's definitely no neurotoxic effect of benzodiazepines. Not at all. Okay? Whether it makes you stupid, well, I don't know. But it definitely uh, makes you less active, both mentally and physically. Okay, so okay? it's not very bad. Well, but, but it does have potential for addiction. There's no doubt about that. And, and there are definitely people who are addicted to these drugs. And that's why in many indications where they used to be used, nowadays there's, there's people are very, very careful from using them because there's a, a huge potential for abuse, especially when people use it to remove anxiety. Okay, nowadays a lot of people have anxiety, panic attacks, etc., And it's very easy to get used to this drug that helps you from this anxiety. And this is one of the reasons why people abuse it, you know, because it makes you feel good. And it takes away all the stress and everything, and it just puts you into this very relaxed state, and that's why people use it. And you, I don't know, I mean, if people are following hip hop or something, there, there's a very large subculture in hip hop that use these downers, and it's, it's, a, it's now a very, very big thing. Uh, there could be a whole lecture on that because I think there are some very interesting political implications for that. But let's let's leave that let's leave that aside. Um, what is quite interesting about GABA A receptors is that so many different things bind to GABA A receptors apart, apart from benzodiazepines. When I talk about general anesthesia, so there are other general anesthetic drugs, for example, inhalatory general anesthetics, so the ones that are that is basically a gas that you that you breathe. And all of these gases have been found to bind to GABA A receptors and activate them, okay? Even ethanol, even alcohol, has been found to bind to GABA A receptors and activate them. So you could say that the majority of things, of chemicals that inhibit the functioning of the central nervous system that kind of, you know, yeah, uh, produce these effects where they slow down thinking and put you to sleep, etc. Many of them, I would say even the majority of them, work through GABA A receptors. And interestingly, they all bind to different places on the receptor. It's a relatively big receptor. And they all bind to different places and activate it. It's quite interesting. However, going back to muscle relaxants, to central muscle relaxants, we also have muscle relaxants that work on GABA B receptor. That is actually, as far as I know, there are, I think, only just two of them that exist. One is called baclofen. The other one is called saclofen. Uh, and unlike benzodiazepines, 
which have a range of uses, okay, from muscle relaxants through hypnotics, uh, anxiolytics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Baclofen is really just used to decrease muscle tone, especially in diseases where muscle tone is really increased. So not about some injury that you have, but but uh, either some inherited diseases where there is an increased muscle tone, spasticity, that baclofen is used quite widely to, to keep it down. It does not, as far as I know, it does not have the risk of uh, addiction because it does not have the other effects that uh, that benzodiazepines have. So it can be, it's much safer to be used long term than benzodiazepines. But, yeah. I don't think so. Opioids are used for pain. But pain and spasticity may not be necessarily connected. Okay? So. Okay, opioids will not produce, on their own, will not produce muscle relaxation. Okay? Of course, if the spasm, if the spasm is caused purely by pain, they might help. But there is also spasticity caused by neurological disorders, etc. And for that, opioids will not will not help. And speaking of opioids, you probably most of you have heard about this massive opioid ep epidemic in the in the United States and elsewhere, which was definitely caused by the pharmaceutical company uh, that developed OxyContin, where they just pushed these opioids to everybody, saying that there are no side effects, there is no risk of addiction, it's perfectly fine. And now there are millions of people who are addicted to opioids. Um, Thousands, if not tens of thousands, of people die annually because of this uh, this opioid epidemic. And of course, the pharmaceutical company owned by the Sackler family. Um, and if any of you go to any of the big galleries in London or in, or in New York, everything is donated by the Sackler fa family and paid for. And they are very, um, you, know, you know, they donate to arts, etc. But they are responsible for tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of deaths, um, which is insane. Um, yeah, anyway, Purdue Pharma, if you've heard of it. All right, let's move on uh, to, how are we doing for time? Uh, okay, let's take a three minute break. I will continue after that. Any questions to what we just covered? Uh, quite obviously there were questions about, well, do we have to memorize everything that's in the table? Well, I really don't want to speak about memorizing something because that is really not the point, okay? The point is not that you actually go through the table and memorize everything and just like say it as a poem, okay? That's, that's not the point. The point is to connect what we covered in the previous lectures and say, okay, and there's this one drug that binds to these receptors and produces these effects, okay? So it's really an information, hopefully, that should help you connect the things together, okay? If you take the table and just memorize it, well, then it misses the point, okay? But it's still a good idea to really go through it and try to connect it with the other bits, okay? And if you do that, not only will it help you in the test, but more importantly, it will help you to understand in later years why certain things work in certain way, okay? So there is some logic behind it, but if you ask me, do we have to memorize it? Well, you know, I don't want you to memorize it. I just want you to use it to learn, which is a different thing. Memorization is not learning, okay? It really isn't. It's just memorization and you will forget it. You will forget it, you know, 10 minutes after the test. That's not the point, okay? But use it, work with it, and hopefully, it w something will stick in your, in your head for later on. All right, so now I want to move to a very different area of uh, influencing things by using medications. And we're gonna look at mostly at signaling through adrenergic receptors. And we'll mostly look at it in relation to blood pressure. Because even though we spoke that uh, uh, catecholamines, ad adrenaline, noradrenaline, are very important in the brain to do all sorts of things, in pharmacology, the main places or the main reasons why we want to influence adrenergic signaling is to treat high blood pressure or low, low blood pressure, okay? So, so we'll, we'll just select a, a small part of all the functions of, of uh, adrenaline and noradrenaline.
let's start with alpha-1 receptors. Does anyone remember what we, what we said about alpha-1 receptors? Okay, so, they, so noradrenaline binds better to alpha receptors than beta receptors, that's correct. They cause smooth muscle contraction and we mostly find them not in the heart, but in blood vessels, okay? So they cause smooth muscle contraction in blood vessels. Again, of course they are also in the brain, okay? Let's not forget about that. But we spoke that they are also in the smooth muscle in, in blood vessels and their activation through GQ protein, et cetera, et cetera, causes uh, vasoconstriction, right? So we can imagine to have agonists on alpha-1 receptors that will cause vasoconstriction and therefore the increase of blood pressure. The main agonist that is used to increase blood pressure in pharmacology is actually noradrenaline, okay? So if we need to increase blood pressure by vasoconstriction, we will use an infusion of noradrenaline. And this is used in emergency medicine when there is a, a, a very big drop of blood pressure through various reasons then noradrenaline is one possibility that we can use to constrict blood vessels and keep the blood pressure up, okay? So that would be the normal agonist uh, that would be used in this setting. However, we do have agonists on alpha-1 receptors that also cause vasoconstriction, but we use them only locally for local vasoconstriction. And once again, it's something, it's, it's a type of drugs that probably all of you or the majority of you have used and have and probably use every year. So anyone know what I'm talking about? No, we're still talking about alpha alpha one receptors. And we're talking about agonists on alpha one receptors. So we want vasoconstriction but local. So we're not interested in increasing blood pressure. We just want local vasoconstriction. Wait, nope. Ibuprofen, we'll talk about that in a week's time or two weeks' time when we talk about inflammation, but that's it. Ibuprofen does not cause vasoconstriction. Hmm? Hmm? Sorry? Okay. So these local alpha 1 agonists are used in all those nasal sprays. They have nothing to do with histamine, okay? But when we have an inflammation in the nose and, it's, and there's a blockage there, we use these sprays. Yeah, well, oxymetazolin is one of them. It's one, one of the local alpha-1 agonists, but there are many other ones, okay? And they are used when you have a cold just to de-block, decongest your nose, okay? And the mechanism by which they work is they activate alpha-1 receptors on those blood vessels in the, uh, in the nose, in the nasal cavity, to basically remove the, they don't remove the inflammation. There's inflammation there, and they do nothing against the inflammation. But the inflammation causes the blood vessels to relax, to dilate, and there's a logic behind it, and you will talk about inflammation, why there is, you know, why do we need to bring more blood? I mean, it's kind of logical. But what we do with these sprays is to do nothing with the inflammation, but we basically just constrict the blood vessels so that we can breathe normally. That's all these nasal sprays do, okay? And there are many substances that can be found there. Usually they end with azolin, so it could be oxymetazolin. And many, many others, okay? So these are alpha-1 mimetics, alpha-1 agonists that just constrict the blood vessels. Um, this, yes? There's also an inhalation with like hot, hot water and oil and something like that. Sure. That, no? that, that has nothing to do with alpha-1 receptors, but of course they can help, okay? You can use saline, just a solution of salt and put it in your nose. That's all part of treating colds, but, but these are alpha-1 agonists, and these are in, in some of the nasal sprays. Does it make sense? Okay. We'll, we'll get to asthma, okay? Um, the problem with these sprays, and it's something you probably have heard before, is that you can't use them for very long. You can't use them for more than, does anyone know? No, no, three days. Something like three days, okay? Three days is generally considered about the time that you can use these sprays continuously. 
Why is that? Well, and that's actually true for most G protein coupled receptors. If you activate them too much and too long, they will become desensitized. They will become deactivated. And there are several pathways for that. One is that these receptors become phosphorylated. When they're activated, they become phosphorylated. Then a protein called beta arrestin, and you may have heard about beta arrestin when you talked about G protein coupled receptors, binds to the receptor and not only blocks the receptor, but also leads to its endocytosis and removal from the membrane. So as you keep activating these receptors artificially, their numbers on the blood vessels will decrease. Okay? Which means that first of all, you may have to use more of the spray in order to get the same effect, even though there may be no further inflammation. The inflammation may be gone, but you still have to keep using the spray in order to keep those blood vessels constricted. Because if you remove the spray, if you stop using it, even in the absence of an inflammation, the blood vessels will dilate because they don't have enough alpha-1 receptors to keep them at the right tone. Does it make sense? Okay. So by using these sprays for too long, you basically create a sort of addiction. It's not a psychological addiction that you need it, but it's a physical addiction in a way that when you stop using it, your nasal mucosa actually becomes swollen again, even though there is no more inflammation, okay? Just because we decrease the number of these receptors. So that's why it should not be used more than three days in a row, because then you can create this continuous problem. And people who don't understand the mechanism will just keep using the spray and will say, well, I still have a cold, but they don't. They just have an addiction to these alpha-1 mimetics, okay? And it can create really big problems because then if you have been using these, these sprays for a very long time, for weeks, then it usually takes weeks to get it back to normal. And that's very unpleasant and very difficult to do. Yes, there was a question so here. It is reversible. It is reversible, but it can take time to reverse. Okay, well, so since these are alpha-1 mimetics, we of course also use alpha-1 antagonists. These are used to decrease blood pressure, of course, because they block alpha-1 signaling, okay? I'll mention one of them, which is called prazosin, which is alpha-1 antagonist. So these are agonists, this, this is an antagonist. And it's used to decrease blood pressure. Uh, the, uh, this drug is very powerful. It will cause a massive decrease in blood pressure. And it's used actually quite rarely only in emergency situations where there's a, such a big increase in blood pressure that we need to bring it down very quickly. Okay, so it's used in very, very specific situations. It's not, nowadays, it's not a drug that people just take for high blood pressure. There are completely different drugs for that. But it will decrease blood pressure and can be used in emergency settings. Okay, so alpha-1 antagonists, alpha-1 agonists. What did we say about alpha-2 receptor? Any question? What do we say about alpha-2 receptor? Hmm? It's inhibitory, and it has a very specific function. Nope, that's beta-2. But alpha-2 is a presynaptic receptor. So it actually, its activation decreases the release of adrenaline noradrenaline in the central nervous system from into the synapse, right? It's this feedback, feedback uh, receptor, okay? <coughs> and we use clinically alpha-2 agonists. Well, as far as I know, there is only one used in human medicine called clonidine. And this is used to treat high blood pressure. However, the mechanism is completely different from what we just said about prazosin. So if we block alpha-1 receptors, we're talking about a blockade in the periphery, in the actual blood vessels. Here with clonidine, we're not in the blood vessels. There are virtually no alpha-2 receptors in blood vessels. We're in the brain. And the brain is also responsible for regulating blood pressure, okay? So here, by activating these alpha-2 receptors, we, we kind of block the signals from the brain that would otherwise increase blood pressure. 
Okay? So clonidine is actually a centrally acting antihypertensive agent, unlike prazosin, which is a peripherally acting antihypertensive agent. Does it make sense? Okay, so in the brain, these adrenergic circuits, among other things, also serve to increase blood pressure. And we can block them by activating these presynaptic receptors to block the release of adrenaline and decrease blood pressure. Clonidine, once again, is used in, for very specific indications. In pregnancy, for example, when there's high blood pressure, then clonidine might be used. But, so again, it's not the most commonly used antihypertensive agent, but it works by, these alpha, by activating these alpha-2 receptors. Going on to beta-1, what did we say about beta-1? Well, fight or flight, sort of all of them. It increases heart rate, okay? Its, its main function in the periphery is to increase heart rate. So we can have agonists on beta-1 receptors, which we can use to increase heart rate when it's too low or when the heart is failing or something. One of them is called dobutamin, and there are other ones. Um, and once again, they are used mostly in emergency medicine when the heart is not really able to beat as much as we need it, then we can use for a brief period of time, we can use this beta-1 agonist to kind of, you know, to kick it a little bit so that the heart starts going, okay? It doesn't usually work very long because especially if the heart is failing, eventually it will become completely exhausted, okay? So it's not something that is, that we can just keep doing for a long time, but for, you know, emergency, just to try to get the heart to work a bit harder, um, we can use beta-1 agonists for that. However, much more commonly used, and actually if we had this lecture maybe 10 years ago, um, it would be the most common antihypertensive agent, are the antagonists on beta-1 receptors. And these are, what was already mentioned here, are the beta blockers, so-called beta blockers, which again used to be the most commonly used antihypertensive agents nowadays. They are not so much, even though they are a little bit coming back in, in some situations. You can see that by blocking the action of adrenaline, noradrenaline, and beta-1 receptor, we can decrease heart rate. And by decreasing heart rate, we also decrease blood pressure because less blood is being pumped into the circulation. Therefore, the pressure in the circulation is lower. Make sense how that works? Okay, so this is an antihypertensive agent which does not work on blood vessels, it works on the heart by slowing it down and therefore having less blood pumped into, into the circulation, all right? Uh, <coughs> one drug, I think I put it in the, in the table, which is a beta-1 specific blocker is called atenolol. And actually oftentimes you can, you can uh, guess that the drug is probably going to be a beta blocker that it ends in allol, okay? A lot of them end with allol. Um, atenolol is a specific uh, beta-1 antagonist and works by this way. However, there also exist non-specific beta blockers like propranolol, which is the oldest one. So that's a non-specific beta blocker. It will block all the beta receptors. However, that, is, that can be a bit of a problem because we said that beta-2 receptors are, among other things, responsible for keeping the bronchi with a sufficient amount of space for the, uh, for the air to go in, right? So you can imagine that if you give, in order to treat high blood pressure, if you give somebody a non-specific beta blocker, you can actually cause problem with their bronchi. And in people who suffer from asthma, that can be very dangerous. You can actually start an asthma attack. So in these people, you would use a beta-1 specific blocker and not the non-specific one because that can be dangerous. Okay, so that's just the logic between, behind why we have these various drugs. Okay, now you could say, well, why don't we give everybody just the specific one. Well, generally it's a matter of price because the older ones, of course, are much, much, much cheaper um, than, the, than the newer ones. Uh, but in some patients, it's, it's better, they react better to the non-specific one than the specific one for whatever reason. 
So you can pick, but you have to be careful in patients with, uh, with asthma. You can't give them the nonspecific one. I will mention one other beta blocker, which is just basically to illustrate another point that we had previously. It's called Pindolol. And Pindolol is a partial agonist on beta-1 receptors. It's not an antagonist, it's a partial agonist. It's also used to treat high blood pressure, but as a partial agonist, it has this advantage that it, in the presence of Pindolol, you never get a complete blockade of beta-1 receptor. Okay, because remember, in the absence of any agonist, a partial agonist will actually provide some activity. And it's only when there's too much of the agonist, then the partial agonist will act as an antagonist. Right, this is what we covered yesterday. And this is good, because you can imagine that if you, if you give a patient too much of the beta-1 uh, antagonist, pure antagonist, you can cause problems because the blood pressure can drop too much. Okay? And they can faint, for example, or their heart is start, will start beating too, little, uh, too slowly, and it can cause problems. So with Pindolol, you can avoid these problems of having too much of an effect, because the partial agonist always has at least a little bit of what, what's called intrinsic activity. Okay, so again, that's just an illustration using one drug to illustrate a point that we had yesterday about partial agonists, why they are useful. Because at low concentrations of the agonist, they act as an agonist. At high concentrations, they act as an antagonist. <coughs> yeah, it's a partial agonist on beta-1 receptor. Okay. So Pindolol is a partial agonist on beta-1 receptor, and the advantage there is that by giving Pindolol, we will never completely block the activity of beta-1 receptor. So we will not have these adverse effects, which you can have with the pure beta-1 antagonists, where the heart will start beating too slowly or the blood pressure drops too much. With Pindolol, that doesn't happen because it's a partial agonist. So it will even in the absence of adrenaline or something, it will still keep the blood pressure at a certain level. And then when there's too much adrenaline, it will actually decrease it because it's a partial agonist. All right, with beta two, uh, we talked about this adverse, potential adverse effects with beta two blockers, but with beta two, what is mostly used in clinical medicine are beta two agonists, and they are used to treat asthma. So a lot of these inhalers, which people with asthma use to um, stop an attack, okay, stop an attack, are beta-2 agonists, okay, which cause dilation of the smooth muscles of the bronchial tree and therefore they stop the, uh, the attack, okay. If you see people with inhalers for asthma, there are actually usually two types of inhalers. One is for kind of maintenance treatment, okay, where people inhale it whatever every day or twice a day for months and months and months. These do not contain beta-2 uh, mimetics. Usually there are corticosteroids there or something. But if an asthma attack is coming or is already in progress, then they would use the inhaler with beta-2 um, uh, beta agonist because it can stop the attack pretty quickly or at least make it less um, severe. All right. The final bit about antihypertensive agents, and now we're moving away from adrenergic receptors, because we can also act directly without any mediation of these signaling molecules, we can also act directly on the smooth muscles of the cells and try to stop their contraction. And the biggest group of such chemicals that can stop the contraction directly are calcium channel blockers. Calcium channel blockers. Now you will remember that we said when we talked about the contraction of, of muscles that smooth muscle needs calcium from the outside, at least some of it, um, and cardiac muscle needs a tiny little bit of calcium from the outside, while skeletal muscle does not need any calcium from the outside because the, uh, the, 
the calcium channels that are on the plasma membrane are connected directly to the calcium channels in the endoplasmic reticulum. Does that something that rings a bell? Is that something, yeah, good. Uh, so calcium channel blockers basically just block these voltage dependent calcium channels, okay? They block their pore. They will have no effect on skeletal muscle, okay? Because it doesn't matter that we block the pore because the two channels are connected directly. They will have an effect on the heart because the heart actually needs some calcium, uh, you know, influx in order to contract and also in order to have a normal action potential. So blocking the calcium channel will slow down the heart rate and will also decrease the, uh, the force with which the heart contracts, okay? So that alone will somewhat decrease blood pressure because the heart is beating sl more slowly and it's not pushing as much blood into the periphery. The biggest effect of calcium channel blockers, however, is on the blood vessels, on the smooth muscles, because there we said that smooth muscles in order to contract need to bring calcium from the outside. So if we block these calcium channels in smooth muscles, they will relax and therefore decrease the blood pressure. Yes? So much uh, offers Well, it depends what you want to do. Do you want to relax a skeletal muscle? Then you would use muscle relaxants. Yeah, for example, for blood pressure. Yep. Well, uh, that's something you will deal with in your fifth and sixth year when you have, because it depends. It depends what type of hypertension it is, what type of, pa what type of patient it is. It's, it's not that easy. So this is, I'm just kind of laying the groundwork for you to understand how these various substances work. And later on, you will actually give, you will get all the information how to pick a, a good antihypertensive agent for, for a specific patient. And it's tricky, it's very difficult. You know, is the person obese? Are they black, for example, because, because different eth ethnicities react differently to, to various drugs? It's, it's not easy, okay? But that's for internal medicine in fifth year, mostly, okay? So calcium channel blockers, I will just mention one of them called nifedipine, which is actually a calcium channel blocker that is no longer used very much for various reasons. Um, Nifedipine belongs in a group of dihydropyridines, and actually it's in the name, di pi, dihydropyridine. And you will remember that when we talked about muscle contraction, I said that these calcium channels on the plasma, on the sarcolemma, are called dihydropyridine receptors. And this is the reason why they're called dihydropyridine receptors, because they discovered, somebody discovered dihydropyridines and noticed that they block the contraction of smooth muscles and to some extent cardiac muscle. And they said, oh, well, that's interesting. Let's find what they bind to. And they discovered these proteins and called them dihydropyridine receptors. Now we know that they are voltage dependent calcium channels, but they're called dihydropyridine receptors because they bind these drugs, these dihydropyridines. Okay. Uh, we can also act directly on the smooth muscles of blood vessels by using nitric oxide. So we can also give chemicals that can create, that can generate nitric oxide, and you know that nitric oxide will cause a relaxation of smooth, uh, of smooth muscle by activating the soluble guanylate, guanylate cyclase, CGMP, and protein kinase G, all right? So by this mechanism, we can also give donors of nitric oxide. These are usually nitrates, nitrates, organic nitrates, like nitroglycerin or isosorbid dinitrate, all sorts of nitrates, which get metabolized in our body to produce nitric oxide. There is also a chemical which is actually an inorganic chemical. It's a complex called nitroprusside, sodium nitroprusside. sodium nitroprusside, which actually contains nitric oxide in it. So it's a complex, complex of iron, which contains nitric oxide in it. So it can be also given in an injection or an infusion to very quickly decrease blood pressure in some kind of emergency. Again, these are not generally used for 
just treating blood pressure, you know, you would take a pill every day. These are used in very specific ones. The nitrates are quite interesting because they can also relatively specifically dilate blood vessels in the heart. So they used to be, and I'm not sure they still are, but they used to be uh, used for treating uh, what's called um, angina. So the pain, basically ischemic pain in the heart because you have a blockage there or something. The nitrates used to be used for that. Nowadays, I think mostly they would just uh, do a procedure on it and, and um, yeah, sort, sort the blockage first. Good. This covers the, the part of the lecture. I mean, somebody, I spoke with somebody during the, uh, the break uh, that in last year's video, maybe the, the year before, I say that this, this lecture used to be two lectures, okay? Uh, now it's been put into one because there just wasn't enough time to have two lectures. So the, the second lecture was actually dealing with psychopharmacology. So we would talk about drugs that, um, that are used to treat depression or that are used to treat um, uh, psychosis, uh, like schizophrenia. Since that used to be a whole lecture, I'm not going to cover it all and actually we'll talk about it next year. So next year we're going to have a lecture together where we talk about some of these psychopharmacological treatments and also some of the drugs of abuse, how they work and what they do. But what I will mention now is that the main drugs that are used to treat schizophrenia, a type of psychosis where people have delusions. Do you know what a delusion is? Yeah, when you believe something that is actually not true. Okay, so a delusion is an incorrect belief which you believe in very, very strongly. Okay? So it's not an error, but it's something that really like, consumes your thinking and everything. All right? Remember when we talked about, yesterday when we talked about this mesocortical pathway and I said, well, you see a registration plate which is related to your date of birth or something like that. That could be just an error. Okay? You could just say, oh, this is interesting and forget about it. But a delusion is that it really consumes everything that you do. You just have to keep thinking about it. Maybe you have to do something about it. You have to call somebody, etc. So it's, it's a very strong belief. Um, so delusion is one of the very important symptoms of schizophrenia. The other ones are hallucinations. So seeing or perceiving, because it doesn't have to be visual, uh, seeing, hearing, etc., something that is not there. Okay? So hallucinations, delusions are among the symptoms of psychosis. And the treatment of psychosis nowadays, <coughs> or in the past few decades, has been mostly done by substances that block dopamine receptors. Mainly the D2 receptors, but also other ones. So they're dopamine antagonists. Okay, dopamine antagonists. There could be a whole hour-long story of how this developed. It was by accident, okay? So in the 1940s, they synthesized some drugs which they thought would be antihistamines. And when they gave them to patients, to patients who are actually undergoing surgery or something like that, they noticed that the patients become very calm. Okay? And they were like, mm, well, that's, that's a good idea. We have no idea what these drugs actually do, but let's try and use them in psychiatric hospitals where a lot of people are very agitated and very anxious. We could just give, give them these calming drugs and they actually use them tranquilizers because they produce tranquility. They use them tranquilizers. They call them tranquilizers, and they just gave them randomly. They sent them to all sorts of psychiatric hospitals to try them out. And they tried them out and found out that indeed they would calm their patients. They wouldn't necessarily remove the psychosis, but they made it much more bearable for the patients and definitely for the staff, um, which doesn't always go hand in hand. But, you know, so it calmed patients. Uh, and therefore, they started saying, well, maybe these drugs are not just tranquilizers. Maybe they're not just calming people down. Maybe they're actually treating the psychosis. And from that uh, sprang a whole area of research where they started looking, well, what do these drugs actually do? And they noticed that most of these drugs block D receptors, dopamine receptors, mainly D2, but also other ones. Okay? And they started saying, okay, well, if these drugs work in patients with psychosis, they don't cure it. Okay, let's not be mistaken, but they do remove some of the symptoms. Not all of them, actually, they make some of the symptoms much worse, but they do, remo do remove some of the symptoms, especially these so-called positive symptoms like hallucinations and, de and delusions. So they started thinking, okay, well, there's dopamine involved, or we know that the drugs block dopamine receptors. 
and it removes these symptoms. Therefore, psychosis must be caused by disruption of the dopamine signaling, right? But you can see that this is not a necessary conclusion, okay? This is the conclusion that they made. Um, and further research went into that. Nowadays, there are much more complex theories of what actually goes on psychosis and the dopamine, the purely dopamine theory, which used to be very influential for decades, nowadays is not considered as strong as, as, as it used to be, but still most of the antipsychotic drugs have at least some activity against dopamine receptors. Uh, some of them are very pure dopamine receptor uh, antagonists, such as haloperidol. which is a drug from the 1960s, but still used today in specific uses. Why am I talking about these dopamine antagonists? Well, if you give a drug that blocks dopamine receptors, it will not block dopamine receptors only in the one pathway that we want, which is the mesocortical. It will actually block dopamine receptors in all the pathways that we have. And that creates very unpleasant side effects. So patients that receive a moderate or large dose of haloperidol will actually suffer from a Parkinson syndrome because we will block the nigrostriatal pathway and they will be unable to move, which is actually something you can imagine if you're suffering from a very you know, active florid psychosis, you have hallucinations, you have delusions, you think that, uh, that people are trying to kill you or that there is a conspiracy to blow up the world or what have you. Um, and they give you haloperidol and you are unable to move, you can imagine how unpleasant that has to be, okay? So there are some horror stories that people tell about how they go to a psychiatric hospital. Nowadays, it's not done as much as it used to be, but they would be given just a dose of haloperidol to calm them, them down, but basically they were paralyzed in a way, and it's, it must be a horrendous, uh, horrendous um, experience. I will just say that of course, these drugs will also block the tuber infundibular pathway, which blocks prolactin synthesis. And there is an increased prolactin release in these patients, which can create enlarged breasts, even in men, and it's a very, very unpleasant side effect as well. Yes? Uh, so there's, uh, why is there like a specific uh, Well, I, I put in D2 because haloperidol is a pretty much pure D2 antagonist. But many of the other antipsychotics are not as pure. They will block all sorts of receptors, okay? So, so this is just a, just showing that D2 receptors appear to be the, there is a correlation between the effectiveness and D2 block, blockade, let's say, but not all the antipsychotics are D2, D2 blockers, okay? Right, um, let's leave it there and we'll, pick it up next year, <laughs> all right? And then you'll pick it up again in fourth year and fifth year in psychiatry and, and psychopharmacology. So this is just a brief introduction. Hopefully it's more useful than scary that you have to memorize it. Hopefully you will as, at least get some enjoyment out of that. All right, okay, that's all.